guys, it's Chelsea from The Financial Diet. And this week's video is sponsored by PNC Bank. So something I talk about a lot on this channel are all of the financial mistakes that I made in the years prior to getting serious with money and things that I wish I did differently or that I wish I learned sooner. Don't get me wrong, I'm very happy with where I am financially and I feel very comfortable with the growth that I've experienced, but I also could have saved myself a lot of time and headaches and money if I had learned a few specific lessons just a little earlier in the game. And one of the perks of just getting started on your financial journey is that you can learn from the mistakes that others have made and you can avoid them. And if you've been watching this channel for any amount of time, you know how much I love sharing lessons from my past mistakes. So join me on Thursday, April 6th for Six Money Lessons I Wish I Learned Earlier, a totally free webcast for students sponsored by our friends at PNC Bank. In this practical workshop, I'll share the important money lessons that I wish I'd learned earlier, from the importance of building credit to actually investing instead of wasting every paycheck on happy hours. This workshop is relevant to anyone who wants to get better with money, no matter where you currently are in your financial journey, because you deserve to live the life you want. This workshop is totally free and will be happening on Thursday, April 6th at 7 p.m. Eastern. Click the link in our bio to reserve your spot. And this week, we are finishing up our three-part series all about the intersection of social media and self-image, how this affects our mental health, how it affects our money, how it affects our relationships. We talked in our first video about the classist obsession with thinness and Ozempic in our Members Only Bonus video, which you can access by clicking the link in our description or clicking the Join button. We talked all about the bold glamour filter on TikTok and the rise of the hyper-real video filters that are changing the very foundations of our self-image. And this week, last of all, I want to talk about how social media is affecting our perception of aging. So as I love to do, I'm going to start this video off by quoting myself here in a recent video that I posted to TikTok, which kind of blew up honestly and really seemed to resonate with a lot of people, which I'm just going to let speak for itself. So I'm 34 and I haven't been on TikTok very long, so I'm very much still in the process of like teaching the algorithm what to show to me. So I'm still getting a lot of like general 30 something content and I really have to complain about it for a second. There is a really dominant strain of humor that is directed toward people my age, which is basically just talking about how we're so old in our 30s, our bodies are falling apart and failing us every day and life is basically over. And I know that it's meant to be a joke, but I actually think it's incredibly insidious and bad for mental health to consume stuff like this, even as a joke. First and foremost, your body should not be falling apart in your 30s. Like barring illness or injury, if sitting a little bit awkwardly while watching a movie for an hour or two causes you to be on bed rest for several days, like see a doctor that is not normal like i'm actually way fitter in my 30s than i was in my 20s because i actually give a shit about taking care of my body but like stretch babe go for a walk like do something about it but second and perhaps more importantly like your 30s are insanely young like i'm 34 and i can't even believe how young that is like i feel like i'm just starting to really know myself like things are just starting to get good and i'm so excited for the decades ahead of me and part of that is i go out of my way to find women who are much older than myself who are just living absolutely incredible lives rediscovering themselves reinventing themselves and just living fully throughout the entire thing but also like we very much will be old one day and it won't be a joke and like the biggest disservice we can do to ourselves is pretending like this time when we're so young and vibrant and have everything in front of us is the time when we're old we owe it to ourselves to appreciate and enjoy every stage of life for what it is, not preemptively complain about how old we are. Now, obviously in that video, I'm talking specifically about the phenomenon that many people my age have probably already encountered on social media, which is this sort of weird quasi self-deprecating, but also like somewhat serious sounding humor that's all about how old and over the hill we are by the age of 30. Now, as I mentioned in the TikTok, I think that even speaking in those terms, even if you're joking, can be pretty insidious and have a negative impact on mental health. But it's also not crazy that we would start to have that perception when this consuming of social media is constantly putting us into contact with very young people. The algorithm, as we've discussed in previous videos, doesn't just happen to favor flawless, wrinkle-free skin and full faces because they like the look of it, it's also because it's associated with youth. The biggest stars on these platforms are extremely young, often teenagers. And the majority of content that we're being served on a day-to-day -day basis, once you reach a certain age, is often of people younger than yourself, which, unless you're a teacher, is something that you wouldn't necessarily encounter in a life without social media. And the anti-aging industry, in part driven by this social media obsession with youth, is bigger than ever. As we continue to perceive what are objectively young adults as already over the hill, it's no surprise that people would be in a constant race to look and feel younger. 
The anti-aging industry in the U.S. grew from $3.9 billion in 2016 to $4.9 billion in 2021, and cosmetic surgery in particular is booming, with growth driven by women under 45. In 2020, 41,000 Botox procedures were carried out on under 18s. It's since been banned for minors. And injections have increased by 28% since 2010 among 20 to 29 year olds, according to the American Society of Plastic Surgeons. A 2021 poll by Derm Store found that young women have started using anti-aging products much sooner than their elders, with the average millennial user starting at 26, as opposed to the average over 55 year old who started around age 47. Other findings include 42% of women 25 to 34 saying they regularly worry about their signs of aging, and a quarter of women under 25 saying the same. Younger women are even more likely than older women to say that they would consider getting plastic surgery to fight off signs of aging. Now, the desire to look younger than you are, especially for women, is a social pressure that has been placed upon us since time immemorial, and procedures that are meant to do just that are nothing new. But this constant youthification and obsession with looking and seeming not just younger, but objectively young, is being radically fueled by social media. TikTok in particular has a very young audience. 70% of 18 to 19 year olds in the US are on it, and that age bracket made up two thirds of US users in 2022. YouTuber Zoe Unlimited did a good video overviewing this topic just a couple weeks ago, and in another video, YouTuber Chad Chad told viewers, I have never been as worried about aging as I am since I downloaded TikTok. And these videos talk about how you're often not actively seeking out the advice, but it comes to you nonetheless from skincare influencers and dietitians, estheticians, dermatologists, and other experts, both real and dubious. As a result, people are going to extreme lengths to avoid wrinkles in their daily activities, including things like training themselves to stop using face muscles or making exaggerated facial expressions, using an anti-wrinkle straw so that you don't have to purse your lips, or sleeping in only specific positions. Now, I personally have only recently started using TikTok, and similar to Instagram, I make it a point to curate the people I'm following to generally older women, not just because I want to see what those gals are up to, because they're often living their best lives, but also because I really want to normalize the entire spectrum of human life and remember that women don't just fall off a cliff after age 40, and that this perception of constantly being surrounded by youth that algorithms push on us is not the norm of human reality. But unless you go out of your way to actively combat the trends that these social media platforms provide to you, it's almost inevitable that you're going to be constantly inundated with the culture of youth. Especially now that this messaging often comes in the form of advertising, which is more sneaky and poorly disclosed than ever. It's one thing to tune out a TV commercial, but it's another to see a TikTok video from a real person without realizing that they received a kickback from a skincare brand or a free cosmetic procedure. And even when influencers aren't explicitly compensated for promoting a product, they benefit from selling you the same message that marketers do and for the same reasons. The more insecure you feel, the more you think you're going to need their tips and therefore the more you're going to watch their videos, which means more views and followers for them and the higher the potential for fame and monetization. Something I've always been pretty firm about in my own personal social media use, and it's definitely carried over to my TikTok, is that I don't do any kind of advertisements or sponsorships or even accept any kind of gift on my personal accounts. Now, I do do advertisements on TFD. There was an advertisement on this video. That's how we make a lot of our money as a company. But it's very important to me that if I'm portraying something as my real authentic life, that it is a portrait of what I can actually afford, of the products that I genuinely endorse, of the things that I choose to buy with my own money. And it's also important for my own mental health that I'm not constantly engaging in a hyperinflated sense of what is normal. For example, if I'm getting gifted a hotel stay from a five-star resort for me and my husband because I'm posting about it on social media, the next year the vacation that my husband and I can afford to take with our own checking account is probably going to feel a whole lot sh and I'll be motivated to reach out to them and see if I can get another brand deal. And before you know it, almost everything about my day-to-day -day life is to some extent monetized, which is the path that a lot of these influencers inevitably follow. And it's one thing when we're just talking about a pretty couch or a specific brand of soda, it's another when we're talking about our actual bodies and faces and the products that we're putting on or in them and the standards of beauty that we're holding ourselves to. And as we discussed last week in our members only video, the massive proliferation of these hyper real, almost indistinguishable beauty filters only make the problem way worse. 
Just a few stats from a CNN overview of the teenage look trend. One small study from 2019 linked social media filter use with a higher acceptance of cosmetic surgery, and researchers found in 2021 that people with high confidence in their looks can actually be rattled more by seeing improvements to their face versus those who already had insecurities. AKA people who felt perfectly attractive before a TikTok binge come away from it feeling hyper aware of their flaws. And it's no surprise that a huge amount of these filters ultimately boil down to making the person look younger. There was recently a filter that went viral on TikTok specifically because it shows the user what they looked like as a teenager. It became particularly popular amongst Gen X users who juxtaposed their current selves with a video of their quote teenage self and set it to the freshman by the verve pipe. It was a whole thing. And sometimes, yes, it can be a trip down a nostalgic lane, but also a lot of times it's giving us the perception that we should look younger than we actually are, and that when we turn the filter off, we look older than we actually do. And even some of the quote-unquote pushback against some of these ageist norms only serve to reinforce the problem. It's easy to praise middle-aged women like JLo or even full-on senior citizens like Martha Stewart for not letting age hold them back, but it's also not radical and can even further entrench ideals about youth and beauty when these women so specifically don't look like the average person their age. Celebrities have access to untold skincare products, cosmetic procedures, and lifestyle privileges that help them age, quote, gracefully, but it's just not realistic for most people and can create an even more unattainable view of aging. See our video on how celebrities financially gaslight us about beauty to get a little more info on that topic. Or when Julia Fox posted a video ranting about the anti-aging industry, many praised it, while others pointed out that she was only 32 and also somewhat hypocritical. As recent TFD guest Jessica DeFino told Mashable, Fox gets neuromodulator injectables to freeze her wrinkles and did a paid ad for Xeomin, a Botox alternative. Truly celebrating aging would mean fixating less on women's appearances, as well as featuring people who actually look visibly aged, such as those who have visible wrinkles or gray hair, etc. Fun fact is one of the subgenres of women I love to follow on Instagram are gray hair influencers, and it truly has completely changed my perception about when I eventually go gray. Now, what does all of this say about our culture? Well, it's not great, Bob. Women in particular still feel tremendous pressure to appear young and beautiful, not only because it's so valued, but because the alternative is so penalized. Research shows that women are judged more harshly for their appearances and it can impact their job opportunities, incomes, and more. Former TFC guest Stephanie O'Connell did a good reel on this recently. From her caption, grooming practices like wearing makeup and styling hair and clothing accounted for nearly all of the salary differences for women of varying attractiveness, and that estimated earnings premium was about 20%. And we're also pretty dismissive of older people in modern and Western society. Lots of data shows how terrible it is to age in the US, and we simply don't care for our elders here on a societal or policy level, and that obviously enhances a general fear that we have of aging. And even when it comes to more traditional media, representation of older women in media is very thin. A study of all the top grossing films of 2019 in Germany, France, the UK, and the US showed that 0% of them had a female lead over 50 years old, and over a quarter had no female characters over 50. Meanwhile, often blatantly uneven casting that occurs between couples on screen in which the male actor is 10 to 20 years older than his co-star has become the norm. There's actually this amazing article with a bunch of charts that show male stars aging relative to their co-stars, and it is bleak as hell. With my favorite being the 39-year-old age gap between Catherine Zeta-Jones and Sean Connery in Entrapment. Or another hilarious example that shows how women aren't allowed to age is that in Alexander, Angelina Jolie played Colin Farrell's mother despite being, survey says, one year older than him. She shouldn't have aged those 12 months, right? Now, I think we've established it. We live in a pretty ageist society, and social media in many ways is only making that worse. But what are the actual consequences of this? Well, there was a very good New York Times article on this exact thing by Becca Levy, a psychologist and epidemiologist whose 30 years of research show how ageism affects people. Longevity. One study found that median survival was 7.5 years longer for those with the most positive beliefs about aging compared with those having the most negative attitudes. Cardiovascular events, including heart failures, strokes, and heart attacks. In one study, people had twice as high a risk if, at young ages, they'd taken in negative stereotypes about aging. Their cardiovascular events occurred at earlier ages, too. Strength and balance. Older people exposed to implicit positive age stereotypes weekly for a month scored better on tests of gait, strength, and balance than control groups did. The effects were even stronger than exercise. We love to hear it. Recovery. People with positive age beliefs were also more likely to recover fully from severe disability than those with negative beliefs. 
Alzheimer's, those who held more negative age beliefs at younger ages, exhibited a sharper decline in the volume of the hippocampus, the brain region associated with memory. They also exhibited, after their deaths, more of the brain plaques and tangles that are Alzheimer's biomarkers. Hearing and memory, older people with positive views of aging perform better on hearing tests and memory tasks. And mental health, they are less likely to develop psychiatric illnesses like anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, and suicidal thoughts. And while my personal method of surrounding myself digitally and otherwise with fabulous bitches of a certain age is not necessarily everyone's solution, there are a lot of counter messages out there if we choose to seek them out. Researchers have studied how a growing number of regular older people are using TikTok to showcase their lives in a positive way. Around 14.5% of TikTok users are over 50, and senior influencers who weren't already celebrities include best-selling cookbook author and queen, Brunch with Babs, Grandpa Chan with his dance fitness videos, and plenty more examples listed here. Holly Pan, an influencer in her 50s, went viral for posting videos of herself in young outfits, and while she shares skincare and beauty tips, she uses the term pro-aging rather than anti-aging. As she told BuzzFeed, instead of the traditional mindset of anti-aging, it's a more positive response toward getting old by preparing our body and mind to welcome the changes aging might bring, especially for women who will experience significant changes in appearances and physical well-being during perimenopause and menopause. Actively manage the process so the transition is as easy and seamless as possible. Now this mini series on social media and self-perception has honestly been a bit of a downer, I'm not gonna lie. But my biggest takeaway, and it's certainly something that I've been taking into how I have been using the platform TikTok as it's the one I've most recently adopted, is that we ultimately do have a fair amount of control over the experiences on these platforms that we're curating, if we choose to use them. I can personally say I really enjoy my time on the platform, and a huge part of that is the people that I'm choosing to fill my feeds with, and the images that I'm choosing to see about not just people like myself, but people who are way further ahead in their life journeys or living totally different lives than me. And for me at least, especially when it comes to combating the rampant ageism in our society and on our mobile devices, is to not participate, even jokingly, in the insinuations that at for example, my age of 34 or even older, we're somehow already over the hill. I haven't even reached my prime yet, baby. And chances are, neither have you. And before we leave, it is time for our society member questions of the video. As a reminder, all of our society members get to ask me members only questions each month, and I choose two per video to answer. If you'd like to ask me society questions, see our monthly members only exclusive video, join my monthly office hours, or get access to all of our other amazing perks, just click the join button to become a member of the society at TFD. So let's just jump right in. What is your favorite thing to do in New York City and what activities would you recommend for someone who wants to go on a short, relatively affordable trip to the Big Apple? Um, I actually think New York is probably one of the best cities to visit on a budget because there's just so much stuff going on every single day that's either free or very cheap. Um, there are lots of really good websites um, like the New York City uh, government websites have all kinds of um, pages for parks and activities and museums. Um, there are, uh, most museums have at least one day a month where the entrance is free. Um, all of the parks, especially in spring and summer, have tons of free outdoor activities and concerts and plays going on all the time. Um, there are just, I mean, really almost limitless things to do for uh, very little or no money in New York City. Um, so I think that's a great reason to visit it. You can also, I mean, obviously there are plenty of really expensive places to eat, but there's also plenty of really inexpensive places to eat. Um, you know, obviously the outer boroughs typically have e an even larger selection of, um, you know, affordable, delicious food. Um, but, you know, even in Manhattan, you know, in neighborhoods, uh, like for example, I live in uptown Manhattan, which has, um, you know, Manhattan does not stop at Central Park. Uh, and you uh, uptown have a ton of really good uh, kind of affordable, delicious options you know, in neighborhoods like Chinatown. Um, there are a lot of really good options. Um, there are going to be really expensive neighborhoods like Soho and Tribeca and stuff like that. But even in those neighborhoods, there are plenty of holes in the wall. There's also amazing street carts all over the place. I live um, in a college neighborhood. So every afternoon there are street carts parked all along the street that's on the campus, like the main strip. Um, and they're delicious and um, really affordable. 
you know, they'll park all along Central Park um, and Gramercy Park and all that kind of stuff. So there is just a ton of options in terms of eating um, and going out cheaply. There's great happy hours. Um, there are entire websites dedicated to things like happy hours. Um, so I really don't think there um, that cost should be a prohibiting factor when it comes to visiting New York City. And what are my favorite activities to do in New York City. I mean, I I would I love so many of them, but you know, on a Saturday afternoon, I absolutely love just going to a museum by myself, um, taking a long walk. I live on the west side of the park, so um, I'll walk across Central Park, go to a museum on the east side, and then go for a lunch by myself. That's one of my favorite activities um, in the world. When starting a new creative project or business, how can you navigate how much money feels good to spend uh, slash invest to get it up and running when presently it does not bring in money but has the potential to do so? Um, so this is uh, very easy to, to answer because I just recently did this in starting uh, my publishing imprint, which I talked about in my recent video, which I'll link. Um, but, you know, I did a business case, which is, you know, I made an Excel sheet that um, has, you know, all of my projected expenses, uh, my projected revenue based on previous data from work I've done, market research, um, you know, comparing myself with uh, similar people in the space. Um, and I made a, a, a several different potential outcomes. Like this is what I have, you know, 100% confidence in, in terms of outcome. This is what I have uh, 50, 20, 10, 5% confidence, like all the different possible outcomes. If I uh, sell this many copies, this is what my take home is. Um, you know, if I want to invest this much in marketing, that's how much more I need to earn in order to become profitable. Like I do a full on business case for it. Um, in terms of what is the right amount to invest, it entirely depends on what you think your possible return on investment is. In the case of my investment, depending on how much I invested, I knew I needed to sell between five and 6,000 copies in order to make my money back after um, you know costs and profit sharing and all of that. Um, and that felt like a very comfortable number based on what I've sold in the past, um, that I felt comfortable making that investment at that level and saying, well, even if this doesn't uh, bring in additional money, I will have broken even and I have lots of other auxiliary benefits that I'll get from doing this. Um, but those same kind of calculations can be made for almost any business endeavor. And if you don't have previous data to go off of, um, you know, market research and looking at comparable uh, examples in the space is a really good way to start getting some of those estimates. Um, but it's also really important to have uh, very clear goals in terms of this is what my break even point is. This is what I'm looking for in terms of ongoing revenue. These are, um, you know, even if it's something like I want to be able to replace my salary because I'm looking to quit my job, like that's a very specific number. So using as many uh, quantifiable goals as possible is also really important to deciding what is appropriate to invest. As always, guys, thank you for watching and don't forget to hit the subscribe button and to come back every Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday for new and awesome videos. Bye.